Hey guys, it's Rachel. I uh, am making a tear video today. Um, I am basically done with school. <laughs> um, so I have my bachelor's in English and education. I am almost done with my master's in English. All that's left is the master's thesis. So I've already read what I'm gonna do it over. So I'm not reading any new books for school at this point. So what I would like to do today, I want to tier rank every single novel, play, or epic poem that I've read for school. So that's why this list might seem a little short, um, because there's only 57 books across two degrees. That's because I've read a lot of isolated poems and short stories and stuff like that. So today I'm just going to focus on the larger stuff. Also some novellas, um, so keep that in mind too. What I decided to include was because I mean, I double majored for my bachelor's in English and education. And you know, there's other classes like psychology classes that I took a lot of where I had to read some books. What I did was I only um, put in the books that I read for specifically English classes. And I actually did start with high school because some of my high school classes were for college credits anyway. So yeah, we're going to keep those in there too. And then some of them like that I read in high school, I ended up reading again in college in some setting or another. So I figured I'd just keep them in there for that reason anyway too. Just might as well put them all in there. Also, I feel like the stuff that I've read for um, my universities have... Some of them are kind of different that I don't know. Not everyone has necessarily read some of them. Um, obviously some of them they have. I mean, they're classics for a reason. But some of them are a little bit more obscure. So I figured if I put in the high school stuff, it gives us... Yeah, it gives you guys more to like to see that you know for some reason I wanted to do this um <laughs> like the Devil Wears Prada style so if you've not watched the Devil Wears Prada Miranda Priestley uh is a fashion magazine editor and she is the fashion magazine editor and when she sees a collection modeled she um you have to look at her facial expressions to see what she thinks of it she will never actually just tell you so um, in case you haven't seen it, or if you just need a refresher, this is the, I got the exact quote pulled up. Um, there's a scale, one nod is good, two nods is very good. There's only one actual smile on record, and that was Tom Ford in 2001. If she doesn't like it, she shakes her head. Then of course, there's the pursing of her lips, which means catastrophe. So that's my tier ranking. And so I, I wanted to specify at the top, I'm literally, I'm calling it a Miranda smile because it just means that, you know, we like this book, we approve of it. That doesn't necessarily, like some of the books that I'm gonna put on there are like devastatingly sad. So it's not like, in, for example, Night by Ellie Wiesel. I'm not reading that like, oh my God. It's just, I'm using that as a category to just show that this is like my favorite. And so then we go down with the nods, the head shaking and Purse's lips. Um, one trend that I am noticing with some of these books, looking back at them, is that there's some of them I genuinely don't remember. I know for a fact that I read them. I did. I did all the aside reading. I was very good. But like, there's some, I can't tell you what it's about. No idea. Don't remember anything about it. So I feel like that's probably going to be in the shakes, my, shakes head category. So it's not so much I don't like it. It's going to be more like. I don't remember it, fam. All right, so let us get started. Uh, the first one in this list, we have Hamlet. I'm actually gonna put Hamlet in two nods. Um, that is, I think, one of the better Shakespeare plays. I mean, I feel like anything where there's the supernatural involved and ghosts, and then there's, you know, the question of is Hamlet crazy or is he not, you know, I think that it's a very fun and engaging play. So one of the better Shakespeare ones. The next one is The Metamorphosis, and I'm gonna put that one into one nod, so if you've not read that one, it's about this guy who wakes up one morning and he's a big bug. <laughs> and he can't go to work, and his family dynamics are all messed up because he's a bug. And I hate bugs. I had to read this twice across my bachelor's degree. Um, it's one of those things I think is pretty good. Do I love it? Not really. But I, it, technically. Technically, I think that it's some good stuff and you can interpret it in a lot of different ways, which is uh, pretty cool. So the next I have, which one is this? I can't even tell. Is that Two Towers? It looks like Two Towers. I see Two Towers on the icon. So the Two Towers by J.R.R. Tolkien. And then while I'm at it, I might as well find. Sorry, guys, I try to eliminate as many ads as possible. But this place, this Tear Maker website, holy crap. Here we go. Now we have Fellowship of the Ring. 
we're going to put each of those into one nod. So I got to read the first two Lord of the Rings books for um, a high school English class. Um, we didn't cover the third one because A, no time, and B, my teacher didn't really like the third one that much. She liked the movie better. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the thing is, J.R.R. Tolkien's writing style is really not my jam. That dude spends forever talking about the landscape when there's so much action and drama going on. So, but I do like the story a lot, and I had a lot of fun in the class. Um, that was like one of my favorite teachers ever, and I loved the projects that we got to do with this. Um, we had like a whole bunch of things we were doing for fellowship, but then when we ended with Two Towers, we had to create our own like heroic epic quest, like a story type thing. And she only wanted one scene out of it. It only needed to be five pages, but I gave her like 54 pages of content and then I turned it into um, what was my first manuscript. So yeah, it always has a special place in my heart for that reason, because I really loved that class. Next one, I legit can't tell what this is. I literally have no idea Oh, it says Aurorly. It's so tiny. I can't tell. <sighs> so we have Aurorly by Elizabeth Bear Brenning. That one is going into two nods. That is an epic poem. And it's about this woman that just wants to be a writer. And she's trying to write professionally. And the writing is super, super beautiful. Like, it's really long, but it didn't feel that long to me. Because um, it's like a 300-page poem of a story. Story of a poem, I guess I should say. Um... But yeah, I really, that one was really nice. And I really love the paper I got to do for that one as well. And it was like the first really big independent research paper I'd ever done. And I was really proud of it and I liked how it turned out. So yeah, good memories reading that. And this one is kind of shocking. So this is the Grasmere Journals by Dorothy Wordsworth. So if you don't know, if you know the poet William Wordsworth, his sister Dorothy was very helpful to him in his life. And uh, yeah, really supportive because they were separated like when they were really little. And once they were reunited, they basically, they always lived together after that. Um, but yeah, she was really supportive of him personally. She supported his writing. She helped him write and stuff like that. And I had no interest reading her journals. <laughs> Just being honest with you, I don't really find enjoyment in reading people's diaries because generally their lives are, I feel like people's lives are a lot more mundane than um, we'd all like to think. But I actually liked reading this. Um, I got to read this right before I really got hit with burnout. This was like my last big thing I had to read. Um, and I guess the thing that struck me, I thought that I'd be bored because, you know, the people there probably aren't doing a whole lot. This is England in the 1800s. They're probably just walking around in the flowers all day. And that's actually what they did. So they would, I was just, they sleep late if they don't feel good. Dorothy usually had a headache. William usually didn't sleep right. Um, they walked around the countryside. Um, sometimes they would write about the people that they encountered, especially if there was someone that was poor. Um, that they felt really sor sorry for. Um, they talk about, oh, well, you know, we gave them this amount of money or whatever. And I'm just, I'm very grateful for that I'm not in this situation, stuff like that. And then they wrote poems and they went to bed and they did all the same stuff the next day. <laughs> and like, I know that that sounds boring, but especially like being hit with burnout the way that I have been. I don't know. I think it made me really envious that their lives were so slow. And I guess how nice it would be if our lives were that slow. And I think that her writing style was really nice too, which kind of kept me moving along. I got to do a cool assignment where I took a passage out of that and I turned it into a metered poem, so lit. Next we have The Scarlet Letter. She is once again going into one nod. She's good. Um, I got to read that in high school. It's pretty iconic. It, yeah, I don't really know what else to say about it. I will say we didn't read the first chapter or the first prologue, The Custom House. My teacher literally was like, skip that. It's horrendously boring. So I didn't read that part. I don't know if that counts or not. But I remember being kind of surprised by it as a kid and really feeling bad for Hester. I think that the writing can be a little bit of a bore, but I do like the story. So, And there's just something about Dimsdale, you know? Something about him. Ooh. I'll put it on the screen if I remember or, you know, if I'm in the mood when I'm editing, but the edition that I read for school was the ugliest, scariest looking thing in my life. I'm pretty sure that the people looked like they were made of porcelain. There was a freaky looking baby. Ugh. I don't like it. So then we have the iconic Romeo and Juliet and some of y'all might hate me for this or call me corny, but I'm putting her in two nuts. 
Do nots for Romeo and Juliet because it's literally so much fun. Like, it's such a fun play. I don't care how seriously or not seriously you take it. Either way, you're going to have fun. I love the drama, the dramatic irony, the... Uh, some of the... I, I love the silliness of Mercutio. I think it's fun to read, and I think that the adaptations are fun to watch. My favorite one's the 90s one because I'm cool like that. Um, but yeah, and I also had the privilege of teaching this once um, when I was student teaching, and it was really, really fun to teach. So, and the kids get super into it because it has all the stuff that you that you would want out of a story. We've got violence, we got romance. It's crazy. So yeah. All right, now we're gonna change up. We've been in the same two levels for a while. This is where things are gonna start to mix up. I think that we all know that The Handmaid's Tale has to go into the Miranda smile. Not because it makes me smile, but because it's really good. This book is so morbid, guys. Um, and I don't think that, like a lot of these books that are like really well-known classics, I feel like I don't really have anything to say about them other than what's already been said. But Handmaid's Tale is like, like I said, it's just, it's so morbid, but it was still very readable. Um, I was kind of scared of it at first because I just don't like reading things that are really sad or really morbid in general anymore. But this was readable. I was definitely interested the whole time. The society is so weird. The problems are so <sighs> scary and that they don't even seem like they'd be that far off. So I didn't watch the show because I just wasn't, I feel like it would be really easy to really dramatize and drag out misery. So I just didn't, but I've heard that it was very good. Now we have, I believe this is Death of a Salesman and this is where we're gonna put it into Purse's Lips. I don't remember a ton about this play, um, but I do remember that I did not like it. I'm pretty sure that it's just about a dude that's like overworked or something, which you think I'd be relatable, would be relatable for me right now, but I just remember it not doing anything for me even at the time. So, oops. Then we have Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Sorry, Austen girlies. I'm putting her in one nod. Um, I'm just not a big Jane Austen person. I mean, I've talked about this in my unpopular bookish opinions. This might be my most unpopular bookish opinion of all time, possibly. Um, I think that Mrs. Bennet in this book is like literally hilarious. And I think that there's some really gorgeous writing in here. I just can't feel it as much as I want to, you know? So, <laughs> I don't know. I think I just want more drama and more tension out of a romance um, like this. Oh, Jesus. Now we have Heart of Darkness, Purse Lips. Honestly, I think that Miranda Priestly would frown at this one. I've had to read this one twice, guys, and I really don't like it. So, and the thing is, like, it's, I understand why we study it because of the complex messaging, but I just, I don't like it. I don't like the writing. And I, I respect the fact that English is like what, Joseph Conrad's like fifth language or something like that. I understand that he's technically very proficient in English. I understand that. Um, I just get bored with it. I think I mentioned in the one video where I wrapped this up when I had to reread it. Um, there's one part where they're talking about like an elephant and it took, I had to read the paragraph like five times because I never actually just say it's an elephant. It's like they're trying to describe the elephant with their freaking eyes closed or something. It was so lame. I just don't like it. And plus, it's just, like, racist. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't... That's... It's about a dude exploring Africa being, like, wow. Because he's, like, white. He's from, like... Where is he from? Is he from Belgium? No. Anyway, he just kind of wanders around. And he's, like, wow. Africa is a scary place, y'all. And then there's this one guy that, like, has heads on spokes around his house. Um, this one colonizer and the main character is kind of in awe of him, but not in the ew way, more of an awe kind of way, which is, this is such an unrelatable weird book. I'm not going to lie. So anyway, The Death of Ivan Ilyich by Leo Tolstoy. Uh, that one's also going in Purse's Lips. I don't remember a ton about it. I do remember reading it. I don't remember a ton about what it was like, what happened in it. But I do remember that I did not like it. So there it goes. I'm, I'm assuming that this dude is like dead. I think, is he dead on the onset? I don't know. I didn't care. I'm so sorry to Barry who taught this book. I love you, Barry, but I didn't like this book. Next we have To Kill a Mockingbird. And she gets a Miranda smile. Oops. 
I got to read this one in high school, and I read it, like, in my own time before high school. And it's just, I really like this book. It's so summery. It's so, like, you could just feel that southern heat, I guess. I like that it's written from the perspective of a child. So even though it tackles a very serious subject matter of racism in the South, it's got this lighthearted vibe. I think that this would have been a very different book if it was narrated by her father, the lawyer, who's really the the center of it. So Atticus Finch... um, has to defend a black man who had been accused of um, assaulting a white woman in court um, who was and this guy was definitely innocent but you know things unfold so that one's really good now we're shaking our heads because I do not remember reading The Homecoming by Harold Pinter I don't remember anything about this it is a black hole in my mind I don't remember anything I think I remember I read it in a British literature class I don't remember any details at all so oops and then lady susan i think that lady susan's gonna have to get one nod just like pride and prejudice oops i'm sorry i'm shifting my macbook is this my favorite thing no it's an epistolary novel and i just remember that all of these letters are basically kind of gossipy and they're talking about susan and i think she was like promiscuous or something i don't remember you have to keep in mind that some of these books like early in my bachelor's degree it's been oh my god it's been 10 years since I read them it's been 10 years since I read this book that's why it's fuzzy so sometimes I like the way I'm describing some of these things you might be like did you even read these books I promise you I did it's just been a minute okay <laughs> and some of these books didn't stick with me very well I do remember I got to do a project um with a group of girls uh with Lady Susan though and we had a lot of fun with it we did like a because we had to do some kind of presentation and it had to be like fun in some kind of way or it could have been fun in some kind of way so we did a texting abridged version we all just sat on our phones and like said out loud what we were texting and made it like modern and you know not so elegant sounding (laughs) so that part was fun had a gabbler gobbler whatever Mm, one nod or two nods Mm, maybe i'll put her like I don't know I gave her a three star which granted the Miranda system I'm working with the Miranda Priestly Devil Wears Prada system is not like five through one star like it's complicated because Shake's head is like I don't remember it but I don't know I think I'm gonna put it in one nod I don't remember a ton about what this had to deal with I remember the paper I wrote though because I talked about Hedda Gabler's guns as symbolism I think that she murdered people isn't that what happened Yeah, whatever. Okay. Next, we have a passage to India. I give this like two stars on Goodreads. Um, I'm actually going to put her, I remember her pretty well. We're going to put a passage to India into one nod. Oops. Oh my God. Can I click? Evidently not. Okay. So this one definitely deals with colonialism. And it's basically about how it's hard for the English and the Indians you know, in India, to be friends, even when they have good intentions, because just of the colonial situation. And I liked the incorporations of like spirituality. I think that there were a couple interesting characters in there. So I had an okay time reading that one. The Reluctant Fundamentalist. Oh, what do I do with this one? I kind of want to shake my head or no, I want to purse my lips. I do remember it. So I can't put it in Shake's head for the way that I purposed it. I kind of want to put it in purse lifts. I kind of want to put it in one nod. Let's put it in one nod. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt because I like what they were trying to do with the story. I don't like the way that they did it. They tried to personify man's relationship with the United States um, by relationship with this wo- this woman, Erica. And I hated Erica so freaking much, which was the point. That was the point. He didn't have the best relationship with the country and he doesn't have the best relationship with her. But I just hated her so much and it just distracted me so much. So, yeah. Then we have Untouchable by Rolk Mulk Rajanad. Anand? Anand. Yeah. One nod or two nods. We're going to put this one, I think, into two nods. This was pretty exceptional. Gives a lot of insight into the Untouchable class in India from when 
It was like during English colonization. I don't. I feel like I should know the exact freaking year that I should be focusing on here, but I don't. So, oops. But yeah, I think I'm gonna give that one two knots. It's not um, fun. Like it's not happy at all, but it is very insightful and it's very interesting. And it kind of gives you some insight also into some of the conversations around who had the best visions for India. Of Mice and Men, I gave like three out of five when I first read it in high school. And I think it's just because I did like the discussions around it that I had with my teacher. I like my teacher that year again, um, but I just don't like this book. Like I think at my core, I look back on this book with not a smile on my face. There is definitely no Miranda smile. There's no nodding and there's no head shaking because I do remember it. Um, I think that the writing was probably good, but I just didn't like the story. <laughs> I don't like anything about it. I'm so sorry. Circle Wayne and the Green Knight. I got to read this one from Medieval Literature. And this is one of those things that's kind of weird to rate it because it's so old that you just read it with this reverence. Um, we don't even know who the original author was. And it's just kind of a goofy fantasy situation. We're going to put him in one nod. How about that? One nod for Circle Wayne and the Green Knight. And so this is what I mean by like, maybe I shouldn't have used this system because here I am putting Knight by Ellie Wiesel into the Miranda Smile. This is an amazing book. Obviously, it's a Holocaust memoir. It's gruesome. It's horrible. It's gut-wrenching. It's only 100 pages, and it will stick with you for the rest of your entire life. And the writing is super beautiful. I believe it's originally translated from, like, French. Um, English translation was gorgeous. I had to read it twice, once for high school and once for undergrad. Um, but it, was for, it wasn't for an English class in undergrad. It was for a religion class, actually. But it was for English class in high school. So, yeah. Julius Caesar by William Shakespeare gets one nod. It's fine. I had fun with it in school. The importance of being earnest. All I remember about this, I feel like I don't remember enough. It, I remember it being vaguely funny. I'm going to put it into Shake's head. I don't, I can't really tell you. I think that it's a bunch of people that claim to be named Ernest. I, heck if I know. I don't know. Great Gatsby, iconic. I read that one in high school. We're going to put that one in Miranda Smile. Beautiful writing, really fun story. Love the movie. You know, the new one. We got to watch a 90s version, like made for TV little thing for English class too, which was hilariously awful. King Lear. <laughs> one nod or two nods. How picky do I want to be about my nodding? Let's put King Lear in two nods because I did give it a four when I first read it. Do I remember a ton of this one compared to my other Shakespeare's that are going to go into two nods? Probably not. Um, I do remember being really intrigued the whole time with the action and um, this kind of dysfunctional family situation. <laughs> so, yeah. Then I have Measure for Measure by William Shakespeare. I don't remember a single thing about this. Like, I nothing. I have no guesses. I can't name a character. I can't name a plot point. Nothing. No idea. Don't know. Don't know. And I gave it like two or three stars on Goodreads. So like, I thought it was all right, but I don't remember it. Things Fall Apart. Two nods. I got to read this when we were studying the British colonization of Africa in my Western Civilizations class or World, Civiliz World Civilizations class. Um, we got to read excerpts of it, but I wasn't really vibing with it. I don't think I understood why we were reading it. But then when I reread it for, um, my English degree. I don't know. I liked I liked reading the story. I liked learning about the customs of that particular culture. It was good. Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen. Ugh. It's one of those things where do I love it? Absolutely not. Do I hate it? No. My problem with Jane Austen is I tend to be a little bit indifferent. So she's going to go into one knot. I remember thinking that this one was a little bit more promising because she's playing on like gothic tropes um, a little bit. But then it's just, she's just playing with them. If she was doing them, I would have liked them. I would have liked the book better, probably, because I'm basic like that. But it was okay. I thought that we were going to be more, like, have a more emotional approach in this book. But then, like, we didn't. So, I didn't care. Then we have Othello. Ooh, two nods or Miranda smile. I think we'll put them, oh, we'll put Othello in two nods. Um... I love this one. This is one of my favorite Shakespeare plays of all time. Um, 
So yeah, <laughs> a lot of good discussions about this and I got to read, um, analyze some articles about the manipulation tactics of Iago because I think a lot of people, they think of Othello as possibly being made to be gullible. Uh, but I read um, some interesting perspectives about how if he's so gullible, then why did Iago have to use such tactful and masterful manipulative strategies to get Othello to believe his lies throughout the play? So, yeah, that one's good. Ugh, this one. I don't like this one. We're going to put this one under purse lips. This is Why Teach in Defense of a Real Education by, I think it's Mark Edmundson. I talked about this one on the channel before. This dude is trying to basically argue that... No one really cares about education for education's sake, and he analyzes all the different um, factors that influence our view of education except money, which to me makes throw the whole book in the trash at that point. If, you, that, if you're not going to analyze that part, then what are you doing? What are you doing? 1984, Miranda Smile. Some of these I just can't really think of anything to say that hasn't already been said, but I really liked this. I even really liked the kind of what people think is a really dry and boring explanation of stuff, like in the middle. I actually really liked that. Um, I thought it was interesting. I think about this book a lot in everyday life, honestly, because like there's so many things that, you know, kind of come full circle in this book that we can kind of see hints of in our own society um, around the world. So. Oh, the love of my life. Why Sargasso See, I love this book. Should I like, maybe at the end I'll like, maybe, should I organize the tiers? Nah, I don't think I'm going to get that deep into it. But White Sargasso See is one of my favorite books of all time. It's basically Jane Eyre fan fiction, but like fancy. <laughs> um, and it gives insight onto, as to like, um, what Bertha Mason might have gone through before the events of Jane Eyre especially as a girl from an English girl living in the Dominican Republic and the complexities um, there and the complexities that could have unfolded between her and Rochester's relationship. It's, the writing is some of the most beautiful I've ever read. I love it to pieces. It's so good. Next, we have Henry the Fourth, Part One. I don't remember much of any of this. I'm so sorry. Oh, wrong one. Not one nod. Shakes head. Don't remember. So sorry. A separate piece. I actually really liked this when I read it. Um, I don't know if I would like it as much when I read it again, but I will give it the benefit of the doubt. I'll put it in two nods. I read it in high school. It's about these boys at a boarding school. Um, and this kind of weird friendship that unfolds between these two characters and a lot of drama ensues. I don't know how else to describe it, so yeah. Next, what is that? Oh my God, oh, that looks like Antigone. I love Antigone, two nods, two nods. Love that, she's our social justice queen. We stand. Candide, sorry Barry, it's going under here. I love how he's the only professor I've apologized for, probably because there's a couple of the ones that he likes in here. <laughs> Candide is by Voltaire and it's this weird, almost black comedy type situation. And they're like, it really explores philosophy. Like weird, crazy, extreme stuff happens. I, it wasn't my thing. <laughs> then we have Near to the Life of uh, Frederick Douglass. This is another one of those things I feel weird about putting it in a smile category, but like it is an amazing book. Um, it's a slave narrative, obviously. Um, and it's the first full slave narrative that I've read, like, all the way through. So, it's really heartbreaking, obviously. It's really morbid, obviously. But it's one of those reads that feels very necessary to really kind of try to understand such a god-awful experience. Um, unfortunately, he can't even really, in this autobiography I think he does in later volumes describe how he escaped because he didn't want anyone who read the book to be on to how future slaves might escape. Now we have Oedipus the King. Two nods. I think it's so much fun. It's so chaotic. So yeah there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on in this play. It's like so weird that you wouldn't think that you'd feel bad for Oedipus but I feel like you do. 
And I feel like you still get really attached to the story regardless. And even though it's so, like, out there and unrealistic, it's so entertaining. Like, I don't know. I can't really explain. I think it's because the tone of it is very serious. It doesn't try to be, like, a black comedy or anything like that. It's just, it's a very kind of serious play, even though the events are pretty outlandish. I actually have, what is this? What is this? What is this? I legit can't tell what this is. Oh, this is Huckleberry Finn. Okay, maybe an unpopular opinion, but Miranda Smile. And some people are going to be really irritated that I got to right next to Frederick Douglass. Um, so if people don't like Huckleberry Finn because they interpret it as being very racist, I interpret it as an analysis of racism. You know what I mean? So I think that the, I mean, I think that if you read this, the intention behind it is clearly not a racist intention because otherwise Huck Finn's character growth would not go in the direction that it goes. Um, and I don't know, some people don't like the ending and they interpret it really differently than I do, but that's just how I interpret it. I think that Huck Finn is just he really learned a huge lesson throughout this book and he's going to keep learning throughout his life. And one part of it that really gets me both times I read it, cause I read it for undergrad and um, well, undergrad and high school is I feel like there's that moment where Huck Finn has to really decide for himself how he's going to feel about slavery and if he was going to help Jim and he says, all right, then damn it, I'll go to hell. And I think that that's, I don't know, that really resonated with, me as a teenager reading this and then rereading it again later as a teenager um as i think that we all have to kind of make really difficult choices or maybe do things or really embrace maybe what we've been previously taught is wrong so yeah next beowulf it's kind of like sir going in the green night where it's kind of difficult to put a rating on it when it's so old um i'll put it in one nod it's entertaining I'll give it that. And it's so old that like, like I said with Sir Gawain, like when you read something that is that ancient, you can't help but kind of revere it as this like, r this piece of the past that we have. I did read this in high school too. I thought that we read the abridged version, um, but then I read it for my master's and I think I didn't read the abridged version. I think it really was the whole thing. I just didn't realize it, so. The Coquette. I'm gonna put her in two nods read this one pretty recently. So it's about this woman who falls for this uh, rake playboy jerk um, <laughs> um, because she doesn't want to marry the person that would have been the most logical choice and she ends up having an affair with this guy that basically kind of tricks her and leaves her and it's based off of something that really happened and it's just, yeah, basically women were not supported um when they were promiscuous but then men didn't seem to have nearly as many repercussions back then next oh what is that oh much ado about nothing i guess i can go in one nod a lot of a lot of these are like yeah it's all right it one nod yeah like uh, cool <laughs> Read this one for high school and bachelors. It's a fun Shakespearean comedy. Um, I got to write a paper about Beatrice one time and I thought that was cool because <laughs> she's a feminist icon apparently. Dante's Inferno is going into two nods and I use this edition in this video so when I go back and edit it, um, I can remember to buy it because it's illustrated. I think that this is beautiful. I love the writing, at least the translation that I read was really well done. I was a lot more engaged with this. I mean, you wouldn't think, I mean, it's a book about traveling um, throughout hell <laughs> so it's not really a cheerful thing but it's a very dark and interesting kind of i want to say adventure <laughs> i guess it's an adventure right they're going on a trip <laughs> oh the rover the rover the rover all right look afra ben is the first woman to write professionally and like mad respect, but this play did not age in the way that anyone would want it to. There, it's, mm. There's some characters that are just like constantly threatened with like rape and it's just, the, these women really struggle to have agency in their lives and it's supposed to be a comedy. <laughs> it's just tonally, it doesn't really work now. I understand why we studied it, but like she was not really my vibe. Next, 
Wait, what is that? What is that? Oh, Benito Sereno. Benito Sereno. Um, how about one nod? So in this class, we write it in conjunction with um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which now I'm not seeing on my list, which means that I did something wrong. Wait, hold up, hold up, hold up. Did I mix up the images? No, this is Uncle Tom's Cabin. Ew, get out of Miranda Smile. Uncle Tom's Cabin's going here. Okay, we're going to put Huck Finn up here. There we go. That's where Huck Finn belongs and Uncle Tom's Cabin belongs right down here. Well, anyway, so Benito Sereno was kind of compared and contrasted with Uncle Tom's Cabin because, like, Benito Sereno is a book that we think might be trying to be anti-racist, but they wrote it in such a convoluted freaking way that nobody knows. <laughs> but at least with Uncle Tom's Cabin, you can tell that the author was trying to be sympathetic towards African Americans. Um, Benito Sereno, it's like this idiot is like looking at this boat, um, this slave ship, and it's pretty obvious that these slaves have overtaken the ship. Um, that it's not, it's not these white dudes' boats anymore, okay? But like, the main character is like too stupid to figure it out. So it's kind of amusing <laughs> in that way. But then Uncle Tom's Cabin, it's so difficult. Like I got to purse my lips. It's just the depictions of some things are so racist. And then we have this little white angel race uh, savior girl um, that's in there. And it sucks because Uncle Tom's Cabin did a lot of good work to get people to understand at this time when slavery was normal that, hey, this is actually sublimely horrible. Sublimely horrible? Ridiculously horrible. So it did good things. And like it's written in an engaging and emotionally like manipulative way and stuff like that. But like it definitely hasn't aged well. Nervous conditions. Two nods. It's about a girl I believe in Zimbabwe. And she's trying to cope with the effects of uh, British colonialism on her life. I read a lot about colonialism, y'all. Alas, Babylon, I read for a high school class. It's like a post-apocalyptic situation. Uh, I don't really remember a ton other than that. I remember thinking that it was all right. So I guess we'll put him in one nod. I don't know why I've decided Alas, Babylon's a him, but Castle Rock Rant. Oh my God, I don't like this book. I think it was supposed to be funny, but I got bored. Sorry. Then one of the loves of my freaking life up there, right up there with White Sargasso Sea, is To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. I would say, I mean, I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to deal with organizing the order of the images and the tiers, but I would say White Sargasso Sea and To the Lighthouse are probably my two favorite books I've ever had to read for school. I love To the Lighthouse. It's about a family that is really in many ways your typical perfect sort of Victorian family unit. And then our main character, Lily, is an artist and she's kind of the opposite. And you kind of see her relationship with her art and her relationship with other people when she's defying their expectations. I love it so much. I need to reread it soon. Macbeth, two nods, almost into Miranda Smile. Um, that one's probably my favorite Shakespeare play with Othello following close behind. It's so fun. Like, how can you not read this and have fun? Richard the oh. Third. I guess we're going to put it in one nod. It's fine. It was really chaotic and bloody and stuff. So... I remember being engaged by it, but like I also, it wasn't my favorite, but it's fine. So I'll give it one nod. Same thing with Seventh Son by Orson Scott Card. I read that in high school. We're going to put that in one nod. It was okay. So it's fine. Taming of the Shrew. I don't know. I wanted to like this one, but then I just kind of didn't that much. I feel like it could go in one nod. Nah, it purse lips, purse lips slips it's not my favorite I don't even know really what I don't like about it I just think that the whole plot is just not it didn't resonate with me at all so I imagine it would be fun to teach because then you can analyze things like gender but it wasn't really my vibe 
and I got to watch a really horrible film adaptation in addition to a good one. So, and then I guess we're ending with Twelfth Night by Shakespeare. I don't know if I would have liked this one as much if I hadn't already seen She's the Man, um, because <laughs> that's She's the Man is Twelfth Night, but yeah. So this is what we have. These are the tears. Um, let's see. I think that. Oh, wow. This is kind of sad. Miranda Smile is the smallest category. But to be fair, I like, I really like everything that's in two nods. And I, I like the one nod stuff. That's fine. Um, there's four that I don't remember at all. Quite a few that I pursed my lips at. Didn't like it. Um, but yeah, these are the books that I read specifically for my English degree. Like I said, no short stories on this list, no poems or anything like that. If I were to include all the short stories and poems, I would never be able to get through something like this because I can't remember all of them because I've read so freaking many. Um, but yeah, let me know if you've read any of these, if you like these, if you don't like these, if you disagree with me, if you agree with me, all that good stuff. I hope that you enjoyed watching. This was fun to make. I'm sorry about the ads that I probably won't be able to cut all of them out. Hopefully I can. And I'll see you next time. Bye.